Good morning, good afternoon, LinkedIn. Thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. My name is Ben Cutler on behalf of uh, WinPeer here today. This is our second edition of the WinPeer DataSpeak uh, webinars. Uh, today we've invited our very special guest, Bill Schmarzo. Very excited about this. Uh, I'm sure people are still joining, so we're gonna kind of wade into this. I'm gonna go through a bit of introduction. Uh, we're gonna go through, you know, the, the first few minutes here, just icebreakers to get people involved. Uh, again, we're, we're really looking for uh, a lot of community engagement. Uh, we're really hoping to take some, you know, challenging, interesting um, questions from everyone joining the live stream today. So again, thank you for joining. I'm just going to wade into this, you know, again, give it a few minutes as people are still joining. We'll keep our eye on the, uh, on the comments section here. Thank you, thank you, you couldn't hear me. So uh, again, first live uh, event here on LinkedIn. I apologize uh, on mute there. Uh, welcome to the second edition of WinPeer Data Speak webinars. My name is Ben Cutler. We've invited our very special guest, Bill Schmarzo. Uh, very excited to be here today. Today is Thursday, June 23rd, 2022nd. Uh, I hope you're all doing uh, really well. So again, we're just gonna wade into this. For the first few minutes here, I've got a bit of introduction. Uh, wanna get some community engagement uh, from everyone joining the live stream today. Um, so, you know, again, we're gonna kind of wade into this. Um, please raise your hand, say hello as you're joining the, uh, the, uh, the live stream today. Uh, we, we are hoping for uh, live questions, challenging live questions. Uh, we're gonna shoot those over to Bill to get, uh, to get you know, some feedback and responses from Bill. Uh, but again, just wading into this, my name is Ben Cutler here with WinPeer. Happy to have you today. Uh, a bit of introduction about the webinar today. Data and technology is directly and indirectly empowering countries, economies, governments, educational institutions, law enforcement, companies, products, processes, and all of us to live, work, play, communicate, to trade, and perform uh, like we've never been able to uh, historically. Data is allowing us to understand and transform the way that we perceive and think about our past, present, and future. The topic of the webinar today is data monetization. So we're expecting industry leaders and experts to jump in with questions and comments surrounding business modernization, data strategy, master data management, data science, business intelligence, machine learning, predictive analytics, artificial intelligence, uh, data-driven decisions, data monetization, digital transformation, and a lot more. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a quick peek at the comments section here. Looking forward to the conversation. Great, thank you, Aftab, really appreciate that. And again, please, uh, everyone joining the, the, the live stream here today, Let's, uh, let's see what we can do to, uh, to get the LinkedIn algorithms uh, working for us, right? Please, if, if you support what we're doing here today, uh, inviting Bill Schmarzo and other industry uh, leaders and experts uh, to these webinars to discuss topics that are relevant to you, to your industry, um, please uh, take a minute to like and share the event today. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, really appreciate your su your support and really appreciate you joining. So as we kind of wade into this, I'm going to bring Bill on here in, in just a, a few minutes. Uh, we've got a few people uh, coming on to say hello. Bill, thank you for, for jumping in. I appreciate that. Uh, Steve, you're from London. Thank you for joining. Really appreciate that. Again, folks, please, uh, you know, let's let's get the, al the, uh, the LinkedIn algorithms working here today. Um, you know, leave some comments. Let us know uh, where are you from, right? Are you are you joining us from some exotic remote location with with beautiful weather? 
Um, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Colorado Springs, Palo Alto, uh, really appreciate you joining today. Um, yeah, jump in and, and, and let us know where you're at. What, you know, what, what got you into data, right? We're taking a few minutes here just to warm up as people are still, you know, inevitably going, going to be joining the, uh, the live stream and probably joining a little bit late here. So let's try to make some noise, you know, leave us some comments from Canada, from Colombia. That's great. Really appreciate the comments there. Really appreciate the, the engagement. Um, beyond that, uh, yeah, t you know, let us know. Um, Austin, Texas. Hey, Kendra, John, great to see you guys. Really appreciate you joining. Great to have you here. Uh, actually, I have a shout out planned for you later, but uh, good to see you now. Tell us, um, you know, what, what got you into uh, the data field? Why did you choose to work with data, right? It, let's, let's pump up the algorithms. Let's, uh, you know, again, like and share the event. Uh, please, uh, you know, if you support what we're doing here. Um, and, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. What got you into data? Uh, you know, what, what's your passion? Um, we'd, we'd love to see some more uh, responses in the comments here. Um, yeah. Also, you know, did you hear about this event from Bill or, or did you hear about the, the event from uh, Winpeer? Uh, and if you heard about the event from Bill, uh, how do you know Bill? Right. Chat into us. Chat into us. Get the comments moving. Uh, Marbella is here. That's great. Thank you, Catherine. Great to see everybody today. Uh, somebody let me know how many how many people do we have uh, on uh, live at this point here? I can't see the actual number, but if somebody wants to uh, to let me know, I'd appreciate that. But um, again, just looking for community engagement. What are we doing today? I'm going to bring Bill Schmarzo in uh, to the webinar here today. This is all about answering your questions, right, around data monetization, data strategy, business monetization. Um, you know, there, there aren't any questions that are off limits. Um, we're really hoping to take some challenging questions today, some, some questions that will challenge our understanding, some questions that will challenge, uh, you know, the... The, the common, you know, the most common approaches. Again, really looking for some engagement today with uh, with this webinar. So please uh, jump in, chime in in the, the comment section. Let us know that you're here, where you're from, how you heard about the webinar, what got you into data. Uh, would love to uh, to hear from you that way. And we're, we're keeping our eyes on the comments here. Now, I, I also want to point out just general housekeeping. We are going for questions as they come up. So please submit questions just through the chat there. Again, that's probably LinkedIn comments. Um, we, we, we're really hoping for questions. I, I have questions, my team has questions. Um, you know, we've, we've received a few questions in advance, but again, you know, the more engagement we can get here, the more we can all learn from each other. So again, really appreciate everyone joining today. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, move into it. So again, first and foremost, a big thanks to Bill Schmarzo uh, for joining us today. I'll be introducing Bill in just a minute. Um, just a quick shout out here. Some of the names that I recognize, uh, some of the folks that have uh, registered for the webinar, friends, partners, and clients. Um, Want to send a shout out to James, Kendra, John, Vicky, Robert, David, Osana, uh, and Henrik. Um, a few of the names that I did recognize there and really great to see you guys uh, registered for the webinar. Really appreciate your support. Um, also a big shout out to uh, our uh, WinPeer partner Locate, a GBG company, which is an industry leader in location intelligence and address verification solutions. Yesterday, Locate won the Retail Systems Award for e-commerce technology vendor of the year. Uh, this is a pretty big deal. So a big congratulations and really glad to see some of you registered for this event as well. So take a, taking a look at the, uh, the comments here. Uh, I see uh, Steve, Steve, welcome to the, uh, to the webinar here. Uh, read all three of his books, that's great, really appreciate it. Um, that's great. So quick introductions, I'm gonna introduce myself and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring Bill into the event today. Uh, my name is Ben Cutler. I've been mastering data since 2015. Um, I have more than a decade in sales management and technology. Uh, at WinPure, I lead sales and customer, de customer development. Uh, I also contribute to marketing and product development. 
Uh, here at WinPure, we're developing innovative technologies and strategies that are helping to solve some of the most critical modern data management, data science, data transformation, and data monetization challenges with simple to use record linkage and data transformation technologies, including our disruptive clean and match master data management technology. I've personally contributed to high profile data transformation and master data management projects all around the world in healthcare, in government, in retail, uh, in research projects, education, uh, in the financial sector, and many other industries. Uh, for more information on WinPeer, please visit us at winpeer.com. Uh, now I, I'm excited to introduce our, our very special guest today, uh, Mr. Bill Schmarzo. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, and bring in our special guest here, Bill. Great to see you. Really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, if you want to say a quick hello, I do have some introduction. I, I don't want you to introdu introduce yourself here. So if you want to jump on and say hello, I'll go through an introduction and then we'll open it up to questions. All right, but we're, this is a Hawaiian theme. Where Where's your drink? I, I know. Mean, come I, on. You know, I, I, I lost the umbrella for my drink, but, uh, you know, hey, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, Bill. I, I really tried and you know, I meant to bring the hat too. I mean, you know, you're, you're making this so much fun. I love the background. Uh, I, I love the the genuine spirit uh, that you bring to these conversations. I, I have a great time talking with you, and I really appreciate all of your uh, your contributions uh, to our space. So, you know, really, thanks so much. No, well, thanks for having me. I'm eager, I'm eager for the questions. These are always great learning experiences for me. Um, just this morning, I had a conversation on LinkedIn, a blog I just released, and somebody had asked some really insightful questions that I, I'm going to go back and change the blog. It, I, I had some things wrong in the blog, and this is this is how this is how I learn, and hopefully this is how we all learn is that we you know we get involved in these things, we ask lots of questions, we raise our hands, we're not afraid to be you know Tom Hanks in the movie Big and say I don't get it, and explain it in more detail. And I think that's what we should be demanding. We should be demanding that the people who who talk about these topics you know, explain them in detail, explain them from a pragmatic sense. So we don't want a bunch of hokey dokey theorems. We want, we want people who can help us leverage technology to make money, baby. I love it. Well, and you know, one of the things that I've been saying, so I've, I've been, you know, I've been working with technology and, 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 and startups for many years. And one of the things that I've been saying for many years, I mean, time is moving quickly. Life is changing very quickly and we need to embrace Right. And I, I think I'm, you know, kind of echoing you here, but we really need to embrace trial and error. We really need to embrace an ongoing learning process. And, you know, it, it shouldn't be, you know, commonplace that we're showing up and expected to have all of the answers. Right. We're all learning. And that's what we're here. That, you know, that's what we're here to do today. That's that's the spirit of the show today. Well, let the learning begin. <laughs> that's awesome. So I'm, I'm loving to see the chat comments here. And again, I, I want to keep people engaged. That's what this is all about. So I'm going to go through a quick uh, kind of introduction of Bill for those that, you know, might might not, you know, be so familiar with his background. But I'm, uh, I'm loving the engagement that we're seeing thus far. Um, please, you know, folks, uh, questions, comments, suggestions, topics, um, please, you know, jump in and, and let's 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 get those LinkedIn uh, algorithms working for us here. So. Uh, quick introduction, uh, just on behalf of Bill here, because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I, I don't want Bill introducing himself here. Uh, Dean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Bill is known as the uh, Dean of Big Data, and uh, among many other titles, uh, also the number one business leader, influencer in business intelligence. Uh, Bill is, Bill, if, you know, feel free, show uh, books now. Uh, Bill is the author of four renowned uh, books on big data. Uh, Bill is, there it is, uh, the economics of data, analytics, and digital transformation. I'm, I'm going to pick up at least one of these books. Soon. I see, I, it, it, my, my kids told me that the only way that I could have made the title of this book any more boring is to somehow shoehorn the word broccoli in here. <laughs> well, and is that the same book that you previously wanted to name? Uh, I think it was the, the CDO's playbook. Uh, is that yeah. what it was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I think it's great. I, I think it's an accurate. I mean, I'll have to read the book to, to know whether or not it's accurate. But bring I'll, your I'll no dos and, and uh, bring your Hawaiian drinks with umbrellas because it's it's a it's about economics. It's about you know it's not about any of the fancy sexy stuff of data science and machine learning, artificial intelligence. It's 
it's boring. It's like, you know, how do we make money with this stuff? Snore, snore. You know, and, and I'm glad you bring that up early. So I, I, I didn't get through the entire uh, intro here, but no need to, right? We're going to keep this uh, very informal and yeah, with lots of engagement. It. Yeah. Um, you, you brought up uh, the, the the topic economics uh, right away, and that and that's one of the 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 topics that I have noted here, or subtopics that I have noted because uh, you mentioned um, that uh, the concept of economics is one of the most important concepts. Uh, for businesses and society as a whole. And uh, I, I do have uh, my own question uh, surrounding that. So we'll we'll come back to the question. Let let me uh, let me just so you know we, we, we do get around to some of your accomplishments here. I want to make sure to uh, to cover this here, especially for folks that are not so familiar. Uh, so Bill is the author of four renowned books on big data. Um, Bill has a background uh, at uh, Yahoo, Hitachi, uh, most recently with Dell Technologies, uh, a uh, really uh, data strategy executive. Um, uh, Bill has uh, won an award uh, that was the Hitachi Limited Solution Innovation Award. Uh, and he won that award for his groundbreaking work on data science and automated machine learning. Um, and, you know, Bill has decades of experience driving and leading the data management, data monetization, and data science strategies uh, with, you know, very large companies and, and I'm sure also very, you know, consulting to, you know, small and medium large, uh, small and medium companies as well. Uh, Bill is also an adjunct professor at Menlo College. He is also an honorary professor at the National University of Ireland Galway, uh, and he is an executive fellow at the University of San Francisco. So, you know, again, I, I am personally humbled and uh, extremely appreciative of all of your work, all of your contributions. Great to have you here. We're so excited. And, you know, the, the, the webinar is scheduled for an hour. You know, this could be as short as 30 minutes if we have very little engagement. But Bill and I enjoy this kind of stuff. So we're going to talk through this. We hope, you know, lots of you join us. We hope that you'll like and share the event to get, you know, some of your own network. Uh, joining in as well. Hopefully this is useful for everyone. And then again, if if you want to help us make this more useful for you and your industry and your company and some of the things that you're potentially, you know, kind of facing right now, some of the initiatives that uh, that you're looking at, please send us some questions, right? That's, we're, we're doing this to take your questions. We're doing this to, uh, to really help each other learn this way. So um, thanks so much for the feedback. I, I want to take just a quick second. Really love the feedback here. Uh, that we're getting. Um, please let us know the most important takeaway from Bill's book if if you've read them. So I have not. I'm going to pick one up sh shortly. This event was planned from two weeks ago, uh, and 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 prior to this, you know, being honest, I didn't know who Bill was. So, um, but you know, Bill and I have connected. We've had some conversations. I've been watching his content. I've been reading some of his blogs. So I am familiar, but I'm not an expert. Um, I know some of you are. And, uh, you know, maybe someone else in the audience here can help with the, uh, the key takeaways from Bill book, uh, Bill's books that way. So um, loving the feedback, loving the feedback here. Please, again, send us some questions, topics. Um, Bill, how would, um, I, th I think this is a great, you know, uh, just work through the introduction there. You know, from here, it's pretty informal. I've got, you know, some things on, on my agenda if we're not getting you know, all of the, the community engagement that we're looking for, if we're not seeing uh, questions there. Um, what uh, you and I talked about starting with a definition, a definition of data monetization. Do you want to start there? Yeah, let's 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 talk about data monetization. But before I even go there, I, I, I want to talk about mm -hmm. this word expert. Expert. Yeah, yeah. There are no experts. Yeah, there are. I there agree. are none. Right. It's mm -hmm. in this space. I mean, mm -hmm. you could be an expert of an area if it never changes. Sure. I'm, yeah. I'm the expert of adding that one plus one equals two because I always know that. The, the challenge we have in our space is that we are not experts. We're experienced, but we're not experts. And the ability to call yourself out as you learn new things, as you experience new new um, engagements. I, I always worry about the term expert because that seems, it seems to be such a rigid statement. And I, I mm -hmm. like to try to avoid that. I like to work with a lot of people who are experienced 
I don't like working with experts because experts typically they don't bend, and and we're in a space where lots of lots of bending is required. So with that as the backdrop, I'm certainly not an expert, and never I never will be. I'll be experienced, and I'm always looking for more experiences, which is why, by the way, I have the most I have the best job in the whole world. I get to work with great customers, and I get to write, work with really inquisitive students. Two mm -hmm. different sides of the spectrum who are always trying to, you know, keep me honest, ask me questions. So let's speaking of that, let's talk about data monetization. That's one of those terms that I came out with, and I was trying to, um, not my term, not it's not a term that I originated. Right, data monetization has been around, and I was trying to convey that I felt that the chief data officer was a wrong title and they needed to become the chief data monetization officer, that their job was to get value from data. Now, when you talk to organizations about data monetization, the default for a lot of organizations, for too many organizations is, oh, data monetization means we're gonna to try to sell our data. No, no. And so, which is why I've, I've sort of segue away from the term data monetization. And I've now talked about what I call insights monetization, right? It's the idea that I am, Buried inside of my data are insights about my customers, my products, my services, and my operations. It's those insights. And insights to me are predicted behavioral and performance propensities. Everybody, every machine, every process has a behavior. And I can build a very detailed model on each of those behaviors. And if I understand people's behaviors, if I can predict their behaviors and their performance criteria, now I have a chance to really provide new sources of value to them and create value for myself in the process, identifying what customer, what products customers are most interested in. If they're going to go on a journey, making sure that they've thought through all the ramp. So they're going to go on vacation, but they thought through the ramifications of, by the way, it's really hard to rent cars right now. Right. And so how am I helping people provide a more holistic experience by leveraging all the insights that I've got about the customer and across all of my customers to provide a better experience and, and operational efficiency. So to me, the word data monetization has gotten skewed. It's become this, this, and, and I don't want to, in my age, I ain't got no time for green bananas. So I'm not going to fight those fights, but, but insights is critical. And again, it's these individualized predicted behavioral and performance propensities that I can drive value around. That's really great. Um, and, and I'd love to hear some, you know, some feedback from from the folks in the audience here, the folks that are that are joining us live. Uh, I, I think I think it's really interesting. And, and I think it, it it it's almost, you know, it going back, kind of tying the two things together, being an expert and, uh, you know, definition of you know, definition of expert and then definition of, of data monetization. It's almost like we don't know yet. Right. I mean, I, what I liked about your response is that you said, you know, insights and, and it's really kind of information uh, based. Right. And, you know, kind of better understanding, um, you know, the past and present and future. Yeah, because, um, because data in of itself is not actionable. It, you sure. know, it lays their limp on the floor. Right. Sure. And it it's not, the data is not a value, which is a really, you know, that's a really harsh message for organizations that are trying to mass all this data and they think they've got a bunch of value, but they don't. What's valuable is the it's the insights because it's the insights that are actionable. So if mm -hmm. I know what customers are likely to leave, if I know what components likely to break down, if I know which of my patients in the hospital is likely to catch a hospital acquired infection, right? If I know at some level of confidence, the likelihood of those actions or those, those actions, then I can do something with that. I can act. I can act to prevent their, their departure. I can act to repair the part before it breaks. I can act to make sure that person doesn't catch, you know, a staph infection or something. So the, 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 the focus on data, you know, data is a, a means to an end, but it's not the end. It's the insights. And it's our ability to leverage and apply those insights in a way that helps us make more informed decisions in an imperfect world. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, yeah, that, that, I mean, that triggers quite a bit of thought and, 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 you know, I, I, I think that that's what this is all about is to kind of challenge. Right. And, and I think you completely support that as an educator, uh, uh, you know, as someone spending their lifetime in academics, uh, is is challenging what we currently know and challenging the the way that we currently 
you know, perceive certain concepts. Go ahead. That's Tom. hard. I say that's hard though. Mm -hmm. As, 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 as we get older, our willingness to unlearn mm -hmm. becomes more and more difficult. You know, we grow up with certain beliefs and, and, and frameworks and we default to those frameworks. You know, every, if the only tool I have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. And I, I went through the, one of these massive unlearning processes. It was, it was painful for me. And this is, this was when I went to Yahoo and I learned the difference between BI in data science, mm -hmm. BI reporting on what happened, which is good, mm -hmm. and important, and important role, but data science is not about reporting on what happened. It's about predicting what's likely to happen. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that means that you all of a sudden, there are all kinds of technology challenges, of course, to make predictions with some level of confidence. There's all kinds of organizational challenges that we, we've not solved at all today. Data literacy and decision literacy, we fail as organizations to, and we fail as a human race. I mean, you only, you only need to look at how poorly we responded to the COVID situation to realize mm -hmm. how poorly we are at making decisions in an imperfect world. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot, there's a lot that we need to do as, well, as an educator to make certain that we are teaching everybody about data literacy, where and how data is being captured and used against you in certain cases. We need to teach people about, you know, decision literacy and how to make decisions, inform decisions in an imperfect world. And as mm -hmm. part of that, we need to think about ethics, ethics of the decision we're making, the, the cost of the false positives and the false negatives and all the unintended consequences of the, of the, of the decisions we make without thinking through all the, all the potential unintended consequences. It's, it's really, really hard. And it's hard because it has nothing to do with neural networks and machine learning and reinforcement learning. It has everything to do with how people are wired and how do we help them to think more broadly about this? Well, and, and a couple of things jump, uh, jump to mind here. Um, you know, just the introduction of the, kind of the human element, right? Um, I, I think it's some 40 to 60% uh, the estimated uh, you know, kind of global population that that claims to not have basic computer skills, right? That's certainly going to slow us down. Um, there, there is a question coming in, and this is from James. James, thank you for the question. Great to see you. Uh, really great. And and again, I'm, I'm I'm really we're really hoping to take some live questions here. So and and even if those challenges question uh, our, our current understanding or or, or or the topic as we're kind of presenting it. So James, thank you so much. Really great to see you. I hope you're doing well. Uh, James says, if insights are, I was actually thinking the same thing. And when you think about these things, it you know it's like, oh, let me let me correct what I said earlier, right? James says, uh, if insights are what gets monetized, why is it so profitable to sell customer lists and order histories as raw data? They're quite marketable. So, of course, the data has value in itself, right? The data in itself does yeah, have and, value. And, and you can certainly sell your, you know, your customer lists and order histories. And, mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of work you need to do to ensure that, you know, privacy and GDPR mm -hmm. and all the things are there. And you can certainly move into the d data business. Companies like, you know... Um, uh, AC Nielsen's been doing that. Experian's been doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. Axion's been doing that. They're they're in the data business, and their business model is all around, you know, pulling data from from a lot of different places, especially from companies who are willing to sell their data for for a, for pennies on the dollar, um, and then packing that together and selling it. Mm -hmm. And I again, I, there's nothing wrong with that. I, it's, it's a it's a it's a good mm -hmm. opportunity. But I think you're you're bending over to pick up pennies when there's hundred dollar bills floating in the air all around you. I mean, the ability, the ability to reduce customer attrition by 5%, what's that worth to your organization? Mm -hmm. By the way, I can use that same data set to also improve customer acquisition by some percent. I can also use that same mm -hmm. data set to improve, you know, cross-sell, cross upsell, new product introduction, uh, you know, um, advocacy. There's there use case by use case. Each use case can generate huge amounts of, of value to the organization. And so while I don't disagree that you should sell try to sell data, don't get fixated on, on trying to focus on selling data when there's bigger opportunities to use that data internally to optimize processes and customer experience. And, and there's opportunities externally to build data products. 
that can not only accentuate the physical you know, products and services you sell today by coupling a data product that's comprised of all these insights and the data, but also to build net new revenue streams with data products. So again, I don't, it is some organizations that crack the code, not many, by the way, some, mm -hmm. and it's, it's also very limited by industry. You know, healthcare industries have a really hard time selling our data. They, they do mm -hmm. it, they, they get in trouble and other organizations do as well. But monetizing your insights, man, baby, go dog, go. That's, you know, that's where all the big money is located. <laughs> well, and, and, and a quick comment here. So James, actually, I, 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 I do know that he does have uh, quite a bit of experience with uh, like predictive analytics and things like that. So it's interesting to see the question. And uh, something that uh, occurred to me when you mentioned pennies versus dollar bills is, um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about your perception of the, the, the importance of scalability in data monetization. And I think that's that's to some degree, that's what you're you're touching on there. Yeah. And it, 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 it and it gets back to something we actually started the whole conversation run economics and mm -hmm. the data economic yep. multiplier effect. The data yep. the data economic multiplier effect is a game changer for organizations because you can use that same exact data set across an unlimited number of use cases at near zero marginal cost. Right. So again, if you have point of sales data coupled with customer loyalty data, I can use it for customer acquisition, use it for customer retention, use it for you know, in, in, um, merchandising and promotion and marketing. I can use that same, same data set. And each of these use cases has some sort of an ROI. And maybe it's a small ROI, but I'm getting that ROI on top of a zero base. So, you know, any number on top of zero, you don't need a mathematician to realize that's an infinite return on value, right? So <laughs> these... The, 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 the data economic multiplier effect is, is a really a game changer for companies. And here's the sad fact. The vast majority of companies haven't put their data into an architecture that facilitates the sharing of data. And they don't have the right cor corporate culture to drive the sharing of data. You know, we, data silos used to be a technology problem because back 20 some years ago we just didn't have capabilities that allowed us to you know to have massive data sets to to virtualize it to we didn't really have clouds and that kind of stuff well you know we've we're on we've solved that kind of problem there's no reason why data should be siloed we can be able to link it all especially since you're a master data management person you know that master data management's the key for linking all these disparate data sources mm -hmm. so what causes data silos today culture right it's a cultural issue. Mm -hmm. You've got some senior executive or and some business, business need. The business okay. need, yeah, right. Could be, could be, could be business right. need. But I, I see that you know, there's my favorite example is I was working with a financial services organization, and they were trying to not only determine their customer lifetime value of all their customers, they're trying to determine what what's the maximum predicted lifetime value. If I have a mm -hmm. customer doing this. What else could I be selling to them, be offering to them to improve their overall lifetime value? You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a great initiative, right? So I need to pull data from their credit cards, their checking and savings and mortgages and home loans and retirement programs and college savings programs and blah, blah, blah. It, you know, I got to have this holistic view so I can figure out, you know, who is very valuable and how do I you know, move them up? Mm -hmm. Small business or the small business business unit wouldn't share their data. They didn't want people from the credit card organization bugging them, they're small business users, right? And the wealth management organization was like a like a wall. They weren't gonna share squat because they didn't want the rest of these organizations bugging their high wealth customers. And so you didn't have that holistic view that allowed you to figure out, well, who are my most, most valuable customers? And, and by the way, how do I take customers who are in this category or this cluster and move them to a more profitable cluster? And mm -hmm. so again, it's it becomes this it becomes very cultural. And you mm -hmm. said business unit, you know, there may be business reasons why. There's certainly compensation reasons why in some cases, like sure. people don't want to share data. Yeah. Political comp yep, absolutely. Lots of lot. Well, and 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 really like going back to I think your answer there is that that it really is kind of the culture driving that. It really is, you know, it, it, us, right? Us and the, what we perceive as kind of being an opportunity, a need, a restriction, a dependency, a limitation, so on and so forth. We do have a couple of questions coming in. Look at that. Good. We like that. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Love the questions. Um, really appreciate it. Please keep them coming. 
uh, especially if we can keep them down to you know three or four uh, lines that, that that's helpful so I can at least kind of keep my eyes on that as well um, so taking a look here um, what have you seen is the largest catalyst uh, to break those cultural or trust issues across organizational silos there's a great there's a great discipline out there that is focused on how to do that and it's called design thinking huh. you know, people are going to go what the design what design thinking now i i've gone down the design thinking journey um i become an advocate of design thinking because design thinking and data science literally from a process and success perspective are different sides of the same coin they both try to start with empathizing and understanding the problem we're trying to solve. They both look to democratize ideation and trying to find those variables and metrics that might be better predictors of performance. They all seek to drive specific kinds of outcomes. They all they both embrace experimentation and failure as a way to learn, right? And it, it, design thinking is very powerful. I actually have a patent in process where it, it brings together data science and design thinking as one common methodology because they, they are so similar in what they try to do but design thinking brings a whole set of, of interesting tools, templates, and canvases. If you follow me on LinkedIn, I just released a blog today that mm -hmm. talked about, you know, a blueprint for building data products. Mm -hmm. And it's got three design canvases, three, three canvases that are the result of work I've done with customers in the design thinking space. And it's, it's great. Design thinking does, does two things I think are very important. One, it forces us to, to walk along the journey of our key customers or constituents. So our customers and constituents, constituents are trying to drive an outcome. They're trying to get an outcome. They have an intention, an aspiration about an outcome. What's the journey they go through from the epiphany moment and realize they're trying to get that outcome to the process of getting to that outcome? We can walk along with them and understand what actions are they trying to take, what decisions are they trying to make, what are the KPIs and metrics against which they're going to measure success, what are the pains and what are the gains. And we can literally build analytics to help them smooth along and optimize that process. We can build data products that along each of those steps to help optimize that process. That's that's a great, right now you should say, got my Enough I need from Schmarzo, time to get another drink. Click. <laughs> but like a Ronco commercial, wait, there's more. So optimizing is good, but it's not sufficient in a world that's going through transformation. And my favorite example is organizations that try to optimize the cow path. Right? They take an existing process that maybe doesn't work or is even irrelevant, and they try to apply a data and analytics to optimize it. Design thinking is about bringing together a culture of empowerment where the ideation, your best ideas for what you should be doing, if you're seeking not just to optimize, but to reinvent, the best ideas for reinvention come not from the mahogany row and this in your VPs and et cetera, who, haven't, who, have, who are so far away from the business, they don't know that anymore. It comes from the front lines. It comes from the front lines of the people who are working with the customers and the partners, and it comes from the front lines of operational engagement. So as a culture, how do you crack that code? How do you build that ability for everybody to ideate where and how they can apply data and, and analytics that, to drive improved, more relevant, more actionable outcomes? So design thinking is very powerful. And um, like you, you, it's, it's hard to read a blog of mine without getting a lecture about design thinking. And I like to talk, I'm going to blither on further here. Sorry, Ben, is that no. I was asking, so I was in a, I was talking to a, um, a customer yesterday and saying, well, what's the ideal profile for a chief data officer? And I have to admit, I'm a Golden State Warriors fan. So I just, I just came off our, our big win. And the Golden State Warriors are very successful because they have a strong base of what's called two-way players. Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, um, uh, Wiggins. These are people who are, they call them two-way players, people who can score on offense, but also can play defense. Mm -hmm. And I said, your CDO needs to be a two-way player, but not on technology. They need to be excellent on the offensive side of economics and trying to identify how the organization creates value, 
and it capture and identify the KPIs and metrics against which they measure that value creation effective. So they need to be first and foremost focused on value creation for the organization. But they also need to be a two-way player around design thinking and empowering the organization to identify those variables and metrics that might be better predictors of performance. That's, that's called feature engineering. And the best feature identification doesn't come from the senior executive, doesn't come from data scientists. It comes from the people at the front line of the organizations who can tell you what customers are likely to leave. It's like in the COVID situation, the nurses knew the nurses had a really good feel as far as what were the variables that were indicative of, of you dying if you caught COVID, right? And my MBA class at Menlo College, we actually built, using a spreadsheet, a COVID score that every individual, you input these, these number of variables, we did some research on, and we built a little model and using Excel, right? Nothing fancy, but it would give you a score from zero to 100 on how likely you were to die from COVID. What were the key? So as a country, we decided that we're going to use 65 years or older as the as a decision point, right? That on average, on average, if you're 65 or older, you're in trouble. If you're 60, if you're 64 and three quarters year old and you want to get a vaccination shot, too bad. You got to wait till you're 65, right? So what we found out though that there are other factors: um, body mass index, obesity, pre-existing conditions, smoking, uh, density of the population you lived in. Right. There was there was there were seven or eight other variables that were much more predictive. And when you put it, those together into a spreadsheet and you entered in the, your, the right variables, you came up with a score, which we thought was pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Who were the people who had the best ideas? It wasn't the people on the talk shows of CNN and Fox News. It was the, the nurses. It was the nurses who lived it every day, who could tell you especially the really good ones who could tell you in a certain situation, they probably knew this person's probably not going to make it. And so again, I'm not sure how I got off on that tangent, but again, this no. two-way player concept, you, you got a, a chief data officer needs to be focused first and foremost on value creation. How do you create mm -hmm. value for the organization, which is not an easy conversation because value is more than just financial, mm -hmm. right? We have customer satisfaction, we have employee satisfaction, we have environmental issues, we have society issues, we have ethical issues. All of those things are part of the variable value calculation. But then you got to also empower the organization to say, you know, data and decision literacy and empowerment. So mm -hmm. good CDO like Steph Curry, like Clay Thompson, like, like Wiggins, they're two-way players. They mm -hmm. can do both and they can do both excellently. That's powerful. That's really, I, I, I'm glad you kind of went long on the answer there that I, and I hope the, I hope that was uh, just as interesting for everyone joining live here. Um, great question. Great answer. Um, really, really powerful. You can, stuff. You can kind of tell where my passion is on that one. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, it, I, I, I really enjoy talking with you. Let, let's take a look here. We, we have uh, at least one other question. And so again, great question. Thank you for that. Please keep them coming. We've still got about 15 minutes uh, scheduled on this webinar. Put some, more, put some more nickels in me and get me going. <laughs> Remote control uh, smart though, right? <laughs> so let's take a look here. Um, so the next one, why do you think companies haven't invested in the sharing of data? Why are companies still operating in silo modes? Good, good, good question. It's because organizations don't know the value of their data. And one, yeah. one cannot determine the value of, of your data in isolation of the business. Mm -hmm. We say that again, you cannot determine the value of your data in isolation of the business, which means if you want to have a conversation about value of data to help overcome some of these problems, you need to first off engage the business about what, what outcomes are they trying to drive and what are the KPIs and metrics against which you're going to measure success so I can figure out what data and analytics I might need in order to support that. And what you'll quickly realize is that not all data sets are of equal value. Mm -hmm. There's a handful of data sets organizations have that probably provide 90% of the value. So the, these are organizations who build a data lake. I, I talk, again, talk to these folks all the time. They build a data lake. They throw 35, 40 data sets into the data lake. They stand back and say, you know, Go forth and be fruitful, business users. And business users look at it like, huh? Like crickets, right? No, it, it's they. you just can't make the data available. You need to understand what data is most important for what use cases. And if you're going to provide a data lake, data mesh, data, whatever your data architecture is of choice, 
it's insufficient. Providing the architecture is insufficient. You need mm -hmm. to provide a framework around which the business users know how to think, how to define the problems. We've, we've run a series of really large workshops recently at Dell, trying to understand customers' challenges and going from, from a business need to a business outcome. Mm -hmm. And the problem we heard time and time again, right? Wasn't data silos, wasn't data quality, wasn't data security. Was, I mean, they were issues, but problem number one was we don't define the problem well enough up front. We don't really clear, yeah. clear about what it is we're trying to achieve, what the ideal outcomes are, what are the KPIs and metrics against which you're going to measure success, what are the decisions we're trying to drive, who are the key stakeholders, and, oh, by the way, if you're a data scientist, you better understand the cost of the false positives and false negatives. Because mm -hmm. without the cost of the false positives and false negatives, you will never know if your model is good enough. There's a lot of work that has to happen before you ever put science to the data. It's mm -hmm. not hard work and it's, and it's not complex work, I should put it that way, but it does take a level of collaboration between your data and analytics team and your business stakeholders to make sure you're all trying to achieve the same objectives. Yeah, that I mean that last point there, I think is 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 um, really important. I, I mean, it's just kind of pulling people together and getting them to work kind of on the same page and and kind of with the same vision and and working towards the same goal. Um, you, you know, working in yeah, data quality master data management, you know, and, and a variety of different technology implementations. Um, you know what what we see there often. You know, and I think you know it's not just us. I mean. We see, case study after case study uh, is that you know not enough goes into fully rationalizing like you mentioned the the problem up front you notice notice this chart behind me here right this yep. is a part of it's 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 my, it's probably my single most powerful tool i've ever used okay and what it boils down to is that when i talk to organizations about value creation we always end up talking about again outcomes which translates in many cases to use cases I'm trying mm -hmm. to improve customer retention, trying to reduce unplanned operational downtime, trying to reduce inventory costs, right? Whatever it is, right? Organizations have a bounty of use cases. They don't fail due to a lack of use cases. They fail because they have too many. Mm -hmm. And how do you get the organization? How do you drive alignment and consensus to identify where, where are we going to start? Which use case are we going to start with? And then mm -hmm. where are we going to go? How do I, how do I build a data and business strategy? How do I build a data strategy driven by business that's tied to the execution of use cases? Mm -hmm. I don't need to do a big bang approach. I don't need to spend, you know, $20 million on building a data architecture and buying all these tools on a use case by use case basis. I can build out these capabilities. And the beauty of a use case is that first off, every business stakeholder I've ever talked to can tell you who, what their most important use cases are. Right? They're trying to do this, trying to do that. Number two, use cases by their very nature are actionable. Number three, I can quantify value to a use case. And number four, data scientists know how to optimize use cases. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to add number five, design thinking can help you reinvent that use case. So the use case is a point of focus. Mm -hmm where it's got value to the organization, it's got some clearly defined criteria, ideal outcomes, KPIs and metrics, is a marvelous rallying point for the organization that's seeking to drive value and to build out their data analytics capabilities you know, incrementally mm -hmm. and avoid the big bang project, which scares a lot of small companies. They say, I'm too small to do this. BS, no, you're not too small. You're not too small to do this. Anybody can do this. It's a matter of focus and prioritizing. No, it's really great. It's really great. I'm looking for more questions. I'm not seeing any other questions, but we have uh, some other questions here uh, in queue. Uh, I do. I, I do see a question about blockchain. Do it. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah, as a blockchain, it. it's, a, it's a statement, I guess. Blockchain yeah. could change the game to pave the way for data sharing. Blockchain is very interesting. I I have to admit, I, I I don't know as much about blockchain as I should. Um, it does. I'm, I'm a fan of any technology that supports creating a culture of sharing and learning. Mm -hmm. 
the challenge that organizations have today is that every industry has become a knowledge-based industry, right? Every industry is knowledge has become a knowledge-based industry. And knowledge is based on the idea that we can continuously learn and adapt. The world mm -hmm. is constantly changing. We had a pandemic, we've got a war going on, we have inflation, we have this, we've got potential reset, right? The, the Cubs win the World Series, right? The whole world comes unglued. What do we do, right? So you, 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 we're, we're in a constant world of, of that's underneath, you know, disruption and transformation. And we have to create a culture of continuous learning and adapting. That's why I think AI and ML is so powerful, because I can build products, processes, and policies that continuously learn and adapt. I can can blockchain help me to do that by being able to facil facilitate the sharing, not just of data, but the sharing of insights, artifacts, features. I don't know, but you know that would be a major step forward in helping us to provide the infrastructure and technology that supports the cultural shift that needs to take place. That's interesting. Well, and, and reading the comment myself um, about um, blockchain and data sharing. I'm gonna yeah, just yeah. Quick. I got to stretch. My legs tighten up. I'm still yeah. here. I'm not yeah. leaving. No, I'd, I'll stand with you if you want. <laughs> yeah, just reading it. Just, I mean, just, uh, you know, what, what comes to mind for me is that, yeah, I mean, of course, blockchain could, could certainly help with data sharing, uh, you know, the, the, the privacy factor. Um, I think it's an interesting comment. I, I, we'd like to hear more. So um, I don't see the user name there, but, you know, I, I, please keep the conversation going. If, if you can, you know, give us some feedback and some ideas. Again, this is we're, we're doing this to, to, to share experiences, to share uh, information. Uh, so to help ben, I'm going to I'm going to point out a topic that you're very strong at. Sure. Which is master data management. Mm -hmm. So for for this sharing to work in a federated environment that has some data centralized and some data distributed, right? I, mm -hmm. I don't believe in 100% distributed. I don't believe in 100% centralized. It's, the truth mm -hmm. is always somewhere in the middle. Master data management is the key. A common customer file, a common mm -hmm. product file, a common location, a common supplier file. Mm -hmm. If we don't have that, then how am I ever supposed to join all these data sources from the edge to my core to one of multi-clouds? And master data management has been around for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And we we suck at it. <laughs> we, we really suck at it as organizations. So let me turn the table here and ask you, why do you think companies struggle so much with master data management, which is the heart and foundation of creating this sure. sharing learning environment? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something extremely complex, right? Um, so, I mean, I, I think... The, the best answer I could give you would be one that would be thought out, but, you know, just kind of going off the cuff here. I mean, I think, um, you know, what we talked about previously, uh, centralized and, and decentralized data, siloed data. Um, I, I think, you know, I think just like people, we're all evolving. And, uh, you know, you've got, you've got organizations that have spent, you know, years and, you know, tons of money, millions of dollars putting together IT systems that actually work to centralize data and, you know, centralize access and distribute to the right systems at the right time to the right people, you know, kind of distributing the right views, so to speak. Um, but, you know, each new use case, so to speak, each, you know, each new initiative uh, throughout the organization requires new data and requires a new view of the data. And, you know, back to uh, one of your blogs, I, I think, I think it was a blog, um, the need for, you know, kind of hyper personalization and the averages, right? Yeah, right. I think you were just talking right. about this recently. Same, I, I think the same thing applies here, right? Is, 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 you know, it's an ongoing evolution that, you know, it's not do it once and you're done. It's, you know, you, you're, you're trying to keep up with, uh, you know, literally like, you know, the learning process, the information sharing, the, you know, a, a phone book that's available to everyone, but at the same time, you know, it's, 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 it's built just for them and, and somehow integrated into everything else. So I think there's a lot of, you know, I think there are quite a few challenges there. I, I think the biggest one is, is like you mentioned, you know, time, cost, um, you know, personalization and, and, and averages, new use cases, uh, and how everything just continuously expands. I mean, I think, you know, on top of that, people, you know, people and you know, you've got to have the right people in the room. You've got to put uh, the right time and, and investment into uh, all of that. And it's not just once, you know, it's ongoing. So those are just a few thoughts. 
from me. Well, I, I love that. Because the reason why I start my conversations with my customers on mm -hmm. economics, because I, throughout my 40 some years in this space, I have had just a dickens of a time getting organizations to fund master data management and data governance initiatives. You can't get a business user to spend a nickel on those things because they can't tie it to their bottom line. So this is why I talk about economics. Mm -hmm. Because I know when I walk in, I start talking about economics. And it's, again, let's make it real clear. Economics is a discipline about the creation and distribution of wealth and value. Mm -hmm. Right? If I can talk to them about how do they create value and what are the KPIs metrics against which you're going to measure that value creation effectiveness. And if I can show them how on a use case by use case basis they can create value, I can now get people to say, well, yeah. I want to improve customer retention by 2% because it's worth, you know, $65 million a year. Okay. If it's worth $65 million, can I get you to spend some time? It's even time more than money to help mm -hmm. me make sure I have a consistent customer master file, a consistent supplier master file, right? And to start addressing some of these master data management and data governance things that inhibit this data multiplier, economic multiplier effect. So I, I have really embraced and dived hard on economics because it gives me a seat at this at the table of the CEO where I can talk about master data management, data governance, and some of the other comments we've been talking about in light of how the organization creates value. As it's a it's a business value creation conversation, not oh that's IT's problem. You guys friggin take care of it. You know, quick, quick comment on that. And I'm, I'm looking at the time. So I, I realize, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, uh, probably done. yourself and, you know, lots of other people. I can go longer, but I don't want to force anyone else to go longer. So a few quick things here. Quick comment on that. Um, I, I think what you're touching on there um, uh, very much, you know, aligns with uh, kind of the, the stages that you've laid out of, of data monetization. And the first one is data as a cost, right? It's 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 moving beyond, you know, perceiving data as a cost um, when, you know, it's 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 an asset. It's just a question of, you know, it's an going economic, from, it's an economic asset. It's an mm -hmm. economic asset. And, and going from a poor performing uh, economic asset to, to uh, a, a well-performing economic yeah. asset. So a couple of things here before we wrap up, cause okay. I, you know, again, I don't want to keep you too long. I don't want to keep anyone else. I I'd love to do this again. Uh, I hope you'll come back. Um, we do have a few questions and, and we've got just a few minutes left. So I'm, I'm looking here and I do see a few do you want to try, you know, should we wrap up here and just, you know, get back to the questions on LinkedIn or do you want to try for a quick response on questions like a, you know, rapid fire type, wait, of, wait, type wait. of session? Schmarzo and quick reply. <laughs> maybe, maybe we get back to them. Maybe that's, yeah, the... <laughs> that's probably best to do that. Yeah, yeah me... that's good. Okay. So um, folks, I'm, I'm seeing some questions here from Steve and, um, some of the other names I don't see, but I, I believe all of these questions are in the comments on, 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 on LinkedIn. And some, so. of the, some of the folks have answered the question that have been posted. There was a question regarding this data sharing, not data breach. And there was, you know, Steve has basically awesome. provided some answers how, how that's not really the case. You can actually mask data. By the way, sharing data mm -hmm. doesn't mean you just throw it out on the street and let anybody come gather it. Now there's right. gotta be, there's, you know, there's processes for making sure, ensuring the right people get access to it. You gotta have, you know, again, data governance becomes policies and procedures become critical. Who has right access? Mm -hmm. But anyway. No, it, this is really great. I, I'm loving the engagement, Bill. It, it's been really great to have you here today. I hate to wrap this up any sooner than we have to. But um, Bill, you know, a big thanks from me. Um, folks joining from LinkedIn Live, please, you know, jump in. Uh, give Bill a big thanks for joining today. Um, you know, if you'd like to see us do this again, um, you know, let us know you want to see Bill again. We'll uh, we'll bring Bill back. Um, but again, if you know if you support this, if you like what what we're doing here, you know, uh, thank you again for joining. Big thanks to Bill. Big thanks to everyone joining today. I, I think we can probably wrap it up for uh, for part two here today. Thanks everybody. Malikalikimaka is a thing to say on a bright Hawaiian Christmas day. <laughs> He's been there a few times, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> So, Bill, great great to have you join us. Everybody joining from LinkedIn Live, thank you so much. Please come back. Again, winpeer.com if you'd like more information on Winpeer. Um, you know, Bill, we'll, we'll make sure that everyone has your information as well. But big thanks to everyone. Have a great rest of your week. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bill.
Thanks, Ben.